Baby's First Word by Carrie Harris The house should have been vibrant with light, but it lurked dead and dark at the end of the cul-de-sac instead. Rick reassured himself that this was nothing to worry about as he pulled into the driveway. Felicia and the baby had probably just fallen asleep early. Even more likely, the baby had dozed off and his wife was stuck there in the dark, afraid to move lest she wake him up. These things made sense, but his heart still threatened to gallop out of his rib cage and down the block. He hadn't always been so excitable. Rick was a sensible man with a sensible haircut who drove a sensible hybrid that got 32 miles per gallon, in the city no less. But worries about his first child reached down deep inside him, pressing some primordial panic button at the slightest provocation, despite his best efforts to combat the fear with logic. He forced himself to get out of the car as if everything were normal, instead of running into the house and scaring the dickens out of his family. He took his suit coat off the hanger in the back seat, folding it neatly over one arm, flicked a minute speck of dust off the smooth leather of his briefcase, closed the car door, and triple-checked the locks. Then, and only then, did he walk up the steps to his house. Honey, I'm home, he called, as if opening the door to a dark and tomb-like house was completely normal. Hush. You'll wake the baby. His wife's quiet voice came from the family room, and the sound of it made his knees go weak with relief. They hadn't died of carbon monoxide poisoning or... Actually, he would stop there before he frightened himself again. But maybe, before bed, he would replace the batteries on the carbon monoxide detector to be safe. Reassured, he took the time to hang up his jacket and put his briefcase into the hall closet before joining her. He would offer to hold the baby while she made dinner, and they could talk about their days while they ate. Family dinners might be a bit old-fashioned, but he'd never had them when he was a boy. His home life had been a horror show, and he was determined that Felicia and the baby wouldn't have to go through that. They'd have the best of everything, the best of him. And to him, that meant family dinners and a dad who coached little league or football or whatever sport his son wanted to play. He wouldn't be a man who forced his kid to follow his father's dreams instead of his own. He would be the kind of dad he'd always wanted. But when he entered the family room, the dim light filtering through the curtains outlined Felicia curled up alone on the couch instead of cuddling the baby on the recliner. Now he was confused. She'd been sitting here in the dark on purpose? Perhaps she had the flu, or maybe she was developing migraines. He'd encourage her to make an appointment with their family physician tomorrow just to be sure. It would be a pity if the baby got sick, and she needed to be at her best to take care of him properly. Are you ill, Fee? he asked, using her pet name. She pretended to hate it, but he knew the truth. No. Do you mind if I turn on a light then? She sighed. Go ahead. He turned the track lights on low, not wanting to blind either of them, and studied his wife. She didn't look good. Her cheeks were pale and hollow looking, and her eyes glassy and red. Of course, the bloodshot eyes made sense given their situation. The baby had never been a terrific sleeper and after months of interrupted rest, both of them were feeling a little rough around the edges. 
but she looked worse than she had when he'd left for work that morning. He leaned down to kiss her on the cheek. Why don't you rest while I make dinner, he suggested. It looks like you've had a rough day. Was he fussy? No, I'm not hungry. He perched on the edge of the love seat opposite her and fixed her with a stern expression. Fee could be stubborn sometimes, not wanting to bother him with minor complaints after a hard day's work, but he wanted to hear them. Once he got her talking, she would feel better. He might draw her a bath later. Maybe they could make love before the baby started in on his nightly routine of waking up to scream every two hours. It seemed like he should be sleeping better at ten months, but their pediatrician had assured them that nothing was wrong. What's wrong, Fee? he asked gently. Talk to me. Her face twisted. The baby. He spoke his first word today. This was not what he'd expected her to say. He nearly shouted out loud in his excitement, but choked it off into a squeak just in time. Wouldn't want to wake the precocious little tyke. Talking at ten months. So advanced. What did he say, he demanded, settling himself with effort. Of course, he wished for Dada. But Felicia had given up so much to be at home with the baby, and she deserved a mama. She'd been a financial planner, and a good one, too. They'd met when his office started offering their financial package as a part of their employee benefits. She'd loved her job, but gave it up for their family without a single word of complaint, and he admired that. He would be happy for her if it was mama and be patient. The baby would be calling for him soon enough. Squamous, she said in a faint voice, wringing her hands. He blinked. I'm sorry, he asked, because of course he must have heard her wrong. His first word was squamous, she said. You must be kidding, he stuttered. Or maybe you dreamed it. That must be it. It was just a dream, Fee. You're exhausted. I didn't dream it. Just wait until he wakes up. You'll hear it for yourself. Once he starts, he won't stop saying it. She didn't sound happy about it just resigned. He sat back down on the love seat and tried to figure out what to do. The baby would start crying again at some point. He wouldn't say squamous. To think that he would was ludicrous. But Felicia thought so. And what did that mean? Maybe she'd had some kind of mental break? Postpartum depression? Hallucinations brought on by lack of sleep? She needed help. He would have to make sure she got it. The prospect of clear steps helped drive the fear away. He would wait until the baby began to cry so he could show her that she had nothing to fear. Then he'd call Dr. Carter. Rick had the number programmed in his phone and even though it was late, certainly the answering service would put him in touch with someone. With a little medication and maybe some therapy, Felicia would be fine. He was prepared to take his wife's mental health seriously. From the nursery, he heard a slithery kind of voice say, Squamous. Felicia jerked upright like she'd been poked, looking at him with a fearful kind of hope. 
There, she said. That's him. Did you hear that? Reluctantly, he nodded. Are you sure it was him? That was... He swallowed hard over the lump that had suddenly appeared in his throat. That sounded way too deep to be a little baby. Potential explanations ran through his mind, only to be quickly discarded. Maybe some joker had put a transmitter in the baby's onesie. But who would do such a thing, and why? Or maybe... Maybe the baby was just choking on mucus, and it sounded like he was saying squamous when he really was struggling for air. Whooping cough made kids sound like seals, didn't it? It wasn't entirely out of the question. He stood up, wiping sweaty palms on the thighs of his pants. If his son was sick, he needed his father. It was idiotic to sit here frozen while his kid needed help. I'm going to check on him, he declared. Squamous, hissed the baby in that deep, oily voice. Felicia half stood but couldn't make herself move any further. She watched him fearfully as he marched toward the hallway with more assurance than he felt. Once he saw the baby, he'd be fine. But part of him kept imagining horrible things as he made his way down the darkened hall toward the nursery. What if there was something visibly wrong with his son? What if he was squamous? Rick wasn't entirely sure that he knew what squamous meant but it sounded moist and squelchy and unpleasant, like one of those unnatural-looking fish from the deep ocean, the ones that made him think of man-eating sea monsters. He didn't like the water or the squamous things that lived in it. Never had. He preferred to keep his feet solidly on land, thank you very much. Under normal circumstances, he would turn his back on anything remotely squamous. But he could not turn his back on his son. He flicked on the light in the nursery and flinched. Not because the light was too bright. He'd installed special nursery bulbs that were supposed to be easier on the eyes but because he was afraid of what he might see in the crib. Afraid it might have gills, even though that was a stupid thing to fear. Babies didn't just grow gills out of nowhere. Then again, they didn't say the word squamous either. He crept fearfully toward the crib, looking inside. First, he saw a waving little arm in a green onesie decorated with happy octopi, kicking feet, similarly dressed. Then, the chubby-cheeked face of his son, without a gill in sight. He didn't look squamous at all. He looked normal. For the second time that evening, relief flooded Nick, turning his knees to tapioca. There was nothing squamous at all about his son. He reached down into the crib to pick him up. Don't you touch him, snapped Felicia. He jumped, whirling around to face her in the doorway, and was about to chide her for scaring him near to death when he saw the blood. It stained the armpit of her shirt, an unmistakable burgundy blotch a bit bigger than a silver dollar. He hadn't noticed it in the family room, maybe because of the way she'd been curled up on the couch. Had she been bleeding then and just hadn't told him? What happened? he demanded. He... Her voice wavered, and she took in a raggedy breath. He bit me. 
Squamous, said the baby. Rick looked down into the crib, and the baby seemed to focus on him and smile, like a normal baby who said things like mama. He had two teeth on top and two on the bottom. They looked sharp, and Rick recoiled from them with a feeling of shame. I should take a look, he said trying not to feel guilty at avoiding his son. Of course he should offer his wife first aid. It wasn't just an excuse to avoid picking up the baby. She'd been bitten. There could be all kinds of germs in there. Squamous ones. I'll get the disinfectant and some bandages. She nodded in obvious relief as he stepped away from the crib. The baby didn't cry as they left the room, and that was very atypical. Rick would definitely have to call the doctor, but first he would take care of his wife. He couldn't imagine how it must have been alone in the house with a baby who was acting like that. She'd been very brave. He got the first aid kit out of the bathroom medicine cabinet with trembling hands, took a few deep breaths. He needed to be strong for Felicia. They would figure this out. He'd gotten a promotion at work. They could afford the best specialists. Whatever was wrong with their son, they would make it right. A deep breath steadied him before he returned to the family room. Felicia had taken off her button-down shirt to reveal the tank top she'd worn underneath. She wouldn't even look at the wound, turning her head away from it to study the family pictures on the opposite wall. She'd never liked the sight of blood. In fact, she reacted to blood about the same way he did to the open sea. The baby had left a large, angry-looking bite mark just beneath the armpit. It looked like he'd taken a chunk out, and Rick would have suggested stitches if there had been anything left to stitch. But maybe it wasn't as bad as it looked, because it hadn't bled that much. Upon closer inspection, he realized that the skin around the wound looked somehow wrong. Maybe that was why it hadn't bled as it should have? The swollen skin seeped with some oily fluid. It looked dry and cracked, almost like scales, he said roughly. You have scales. Squamous, said the baby from the nursery. He sounded satisfied with himself. Felicia looked down at the patch of scales radiating from the bite mark and shrieked. The sound pierced his ears. Then she tore the tank top off as if it had somehow infected her with something squamous. But they both knew where it had come from. What do we do? She demanded. We should call someone. He pulled out his phone, nodding in agreement, but when it came time to dial, he didn't know who to call. He began to pace back and forth, staring at the phone, running through his contacts. None of them seemed appropriate for their situation. Dr. Carter didn't specialize in mysterious scales, but he didn't know who else to call, so he decided to start there. The phone rang and rang and rang until the automated system picked up. Damn it, he said, hanging up, his thumb hovering over the redial button. Rick, said Felicia. Rick, it's spreading. He looked at her again, 
hoping that she was just overreacting. But the difference in just the past 30 seconds was palpable. The scales had begun to creep over her breast and up onto her shoulder. Her eyes were wide with fear. Does it hurt? He demanded. She shook her head and began to cry. Rick didn't know what to do. A voice deep down inside screamed that his child was something unnatural, that his wife was turning into something squamous, that his son's bite had infected her, that he needed to put them both down before they hurt someone else or before they infected him with whatever was wrong with them. But he firmly quashed that voice. He would not repeat the mistakes of his father. He'd pledged to always put his family first, to always be there for them. And that was what he had to do. He put his phone back in his pocket. I'll be right back, he said, his voice husky. Fee nodded wordlessly, staring at her arm as the scales continued to creep across her skin. He walked back down the hallway toward the nursery his thoughts floating with a strange, resigned calmness. He'd made up his mind, and Rick was the kind of guy who did well with plans. The baby still waited in his crib, kicking and punching the air as babies did. He smiled at Rick as he reached down to pick him up and hold him close. I've got you, son, said Rick. No matter what, Daddy's here. He didn't so much as flinch as the baby's mouth opened wider than should have been possible. Pointed teeth sprouted from flat gums. This was what had to be. A family needed its father, no matter the cost. Squamous, said the baby, and then it bit.